Thank you and uh, good morning everyone. I'm thrilled to be to be back at this, the, for me, the second event of Come to uh, the Good Energy Alliance. We had a very interesting, like a brilliant session in Kaikachan uh, last year and, and uh, I was very really honoured to take to get the invitation and to come back on this occasion again. Um, and if I can, I wanted to kind of set a context or set a fairly broad framework uh, that maybe might help the various discussions that are going to be had here today. Uh, and I should add, as well as working with the uh, Institute of International European Affairs, I also work with an organization in London called E3G on European climate and energy policy. So that also just informs kind of certain my thinking in terms of what's going on in that broader picture. And I think you need, we, we need to understand the broader picture to be able to understand what, you know, we need to think globally and act locally. And, and, and when we get those two together working really well, if it will really work locally. Um, I would also should say, I'm, I'm just fresh from last night or yesterday, there was a very interesting and significant conference, conference in Maynooth uh, that Trocra were organizing. And they had some of the top people in the world. They had a, a speaking on the issue of climate change. So I'm, I'm informed by that, if you're thinking big. Um, Mary Robinson spoke there on, on uh, who's the UN Special Rapporteur on Climate Change. And uh, there was a chap called Bill McKillen from an organization called 350.org. And, and that 350 is, is coming from the uh, clear scientific understanding that if we are to stop our planet spinning into utterly destructive uh, runaway climate change, we have to lower the level of carbon and, and other greenhouse gases, gases in our atmosphere to 350 parts per million. And, and that all of the science and all the analysis says that if we're going to do that, we are going to have to have a 100% decarbonized power system within the next two or three decades. And I always put that first because everything I do in this space is informed by that assumption. And, and, and I think it's important that in our, in our government policy, in the white paper that's due to come out uh, later this summer on energy policy, or indeed our own approach to the climate negotiations, which will take place in Paris this year, I just think we need a certain honesty or a certain a real debate. If people don't agree with that, I would love to hear from them because I'd love to know, well, are we to say that we will not tackle climate change? That we will abdicate our responsibility in that regard? That we will ignore that remarkable encyclical that the Pope published? I thought people had a chance to read the paper encyclical that came out uh, last week. For me, anyway, it was an amazingly powerful articulation of the moral argument Put aside the religion, just the moral as applies to anyone of any religion and none, for us to take action on this issue. And, um, and, and the energy system is one of the places where we can do it. It's going to be really challenging in farming. It's going to be really challenging in transport. But the first place we can do it, as I see it, is in energy. So that drives my, that's my motivation. It's a moral motivation, um, but also it's a it's a motivation that makes economic sense, particularly for this country. Ninety percent of our energy is imported fossil fuels. We are the most exposed, one of the most exposed countries in the world for any future increase in fossil fuel prices or any disruption to the supply of fossil fuels. Three thousand people die prematurely in this country each year from the air pollution coming from the use and the burning of those fossil fuels. We have some of the best energy, alternative renewable energy resources in the world. They're, they're, so are we going to say, no, we are not going to do anything here, sorry, we're different. We're opting out of the great moral responsibility of our challenge of our times. And, oh, Ireland's going to keep giving seven billion every year to the Middle East, rather than turning to our own power supply. Doesn't make sense. This is, this is an opportunity for us to go to a better system. And I think we need to, that's, that's where I come from. 
And I'd love to hear people have a different vision as to where we should go, because that's, I think we have a, we have a pause at this present time. We pause because government are reconsidering their policy. We pause because we've lost public support and confidence in relation to development, particularly for renewables, particularly because the large, the way that the large wind farm projects in the Midlands for export to the UK um, was managed. And, and I think that's no harm to pause. It's no harm to step back and say, what do we really want to do here? Can we get some sort of consensus and can we go on from here? If I can give some very broad, brief thoughts, I'm not conscious of time, look forward to the question and answers as to maybe how that might work. Um, <coughs> firstly, I do think we should, we need both a distributed new system, the advantage of this new technology is it allows you to develop power at the local level. It allows you, particularly with new solar power supplies, but also with small-scale hydro, with using biomass, with using waste materials, as well as wind, to develop a whole new, completely different, what they call a distributed energy system. There, there's a fundamental change occurring in the energy system. It is completely changing from this old system, particularly in the electricity side, where big power stations looked at what the demand coming from the consumer was, met that demand, and it was a big, centralized, big company big kind of modeling of that kind of uh, system. Be it money point, or be it nuclear, or be it coal-fired or oil-fired power stations, that's the way electricity has worked for the last 100 years. It's completely changing, that old model is dying, the companies that relied on it are going to die. There's a new system coming which is a bottom-up energy system where people can develop at a local level. It's, it's, it's a reality, it's happening, it's happening all over the world. It's happening in America, it's happening in China, it's happening in Europe. Um, and I think we need to grab that as an opportunity, and particularly there's an opportunity for a new ownership system of energy as we move towards a more, more distributed system compared to a centralized big power plant control system. Um, and that's another advantage. This can be owned by everyone, not by the few. Why it will be distributed, in my sense, particularly if we're going to a 100% renewable system, which I think Ireland can and should go to, it also means you do still need a grid. You also still need to be able to move power over large distances because there are times when the sun will not be shining or the wind will not be blowing, and you'd be able to need, you need to be able to balance power supplies over wider distances. And, and a grid helps strangely, even though it's a grid is a big kind of system, it's, it's part of that big district, you know, kind of wider system, it does help local production because it provides that backup structure and allows you balance power over a wider area. So as well as having lost the public <coughs> confidence on the kind of issue of wind power in recent years, we've also lost the public confidence in regards to the grid. There's huge controversy around the development of grid. People do not like power lines in their communities. It's understandable. We need to address that and we need to think and come to some sort of consensus as to what we're going to do. I think we are going to need to connect into UK and France, and indeed to beyond to the west of Germany. The big development at the moment, the project I'm working at in my work with E3G is on the European Energy Union. I'm off to ask Dan tomorrow to speak about it, and um, spend a lot of time in Germany and France and Britain talking to the various governments. The reality is, Europe is moving towards this system, a more regional electricity system, where they ship power across borders. The risk for Ireland, and the real real risk is that we're not going to be excluded from that. That because we got the Windlands, Midlands and the interconnection project wrong, I think it was wrong because it wasn't community owned, because the grid wasn't even community owned, uh, we've created a sense of division that has not that has done huge damage to public confidence and support in what we're doing. Have, we got that wrong to look at so okay let's start again and let's look to see could we do it in a different way. And among community ownership, I include public companies. My original thought and vision on this, and we were setting, my own time government setting out massive investment by the ESB, by Kulchip, by Board Namona, by Board Gash in this alternative energy system, because I see them as publicly owned companies as part of the community system. Okay, it's, you know, it's, it's not about the same as owning your own particular local plant, but the ESB has been our company for 18 years. It has delivered for the people of this country. So has Board the Moment, so has Kulcha, so has BGE. I don't, I, I think they have a role, and, and they, but they have to be owned by the people. 
in my mind, I think it was a mistake to sell bone gash energy. Um, because I think owning it makes a difference. Uh, being, being our own company, it's just a slightly different motive or sentence. And these companies are good companies. These can do it really well. They're not, you know, they're very professional in how they work. So I think we do need to go back to look at, and, and the reason we need to look, in my mind, to the connection with the UK and France and beyond is because I have a vision of a 100% renewable power system, and to do that, you do have to shape, share power over wider areas. It's much cheaper to do it that way rather than try to provide storage here. And we have a commercial advantage because we have very good renewable resources. And that's one of the things I think we need to do. and need to work out how we're going to do it because, unfortunately, the real risk of actually what's happening at the moment is that we're not talking to the UK, and the UK is not talking to the rest of Europe. We could well turn into an isolated energy market, which is very expensive, uh, and which doesn't balance our power over a wider area. Secondly, we need to make sure that we do want to connect north and south. Um, we have a difficult grid project which is before planning at the moment, and it's not an easy one, it's hard to do it. It's up over the Drublin County through Monaghan Cabin up to Tyrone. Um, and we need it. And it's not going to be easy, it won't be easy to build it underground, uh, as everyone would like to do, because you don't have to look at the pylons then. But what we risk by not building it is cutting off the north again and actually going away from what we developed in the last in recent years, which was an all-Ireland energy market. And that was, I think, one of the most important political developments across board. You know this part of the country more than anyone else. I used to come down the road here from Ras Inver, which is a closed road a few years ago. The damage that did, why would we go back to a divided island on energy? And that's where we're going. Because if we can't build our connections and share power across the border, the North will have to go a different way. It'll have to, and it's very close to this now, saying, sorry, it's not going to happen. Uh, we can't rely on our power coming from, from, from the south. We have to build new power plants in the North just to keep the lights on. It's close to that. It's not easy stuff. This is, this is deeply contentious, but that's the choices, one of the difficult realities choices we face. I also would say, and this is a difficult one because the wider grid plans that Airgrid have, building a grid connection to the northwest, to Mayo and this region, building a grid, grid connection to the southeast, um, as well as the one to the north, there's a political opposition, very understandable, and we should be building the vast majority of whatever we can on the ground. Not all of it will be able to for a lot of different technical reasons, but we should wherever we can build it on the ground. But the risk and the difficulty of what's happening is we're scaling back our plans. There's a dramatic reduction in the sort of ambition of the ideas of connecting the Northwest. And the risk for the Northwest is that doesn't just scale back development of renewable power, but it scales back economic development. And actually increasingly, and I am talking to people that large companies looking at big investment decisions, they're going to go to Dublin more and more and more and more, and our young people are going to go to Dublin more and more and more, unless we actually wake up and say, well, we have this resource in the Northwest. We could run, if you get a, which has been planned, really high quality broadband, new broadband connection from New York into Mayo, and you have a clean energy system there, you can start to put digital industries into the Northwest because you've got three key, key ingredients any, any industry needs in the modern world broadband connection, internet, water, and clean water and power, clean power supply. Apple will refuse to do a data center which is not renewable. And there are loads of other companies like Apple want to invest. They will not invest in the Northwest if we don't have the, those components. And if we get one, if you get the power link, then it makes sense to get the broadband link. And then you're up and running. And that's that's the sort and this is sorry, this is away from this is big planning stuff, but we should be thinking big. We should be reversing the inevitable flood of economic investment towards Dublin where those infrastructures are in place and say, no, we're not going to just see the country tip over to the east. We want development to the west. And um, this is all to be said in the white paper that's going to be out later this summer. Critically in the white paper, to win back public confidence in my mind, we need to change the ownership structure. And the development of solar power, in particular, gives us this opportunity. 
Bill McKibben was saying yesterday that this is the revolution uh, that's taken place, that solar power has come down in price by 75% in the last five years, and it's not stopping there. This is what's killing the old model. Everyone knows it in the industry. Um, and even in cloudy Ireland and northern Ireland, solar is going to make sense. The real question is, okay, we can, we're starting at the beginning here. We haven't done anything yet in solar. What do we do? I think one of the concerns I have, and there's a big conference on in Dublin, as we're here today, I'm very glad to be at a big community kind of led project in Dublin, in, in, in Manor Hamilton, because in Dublin, the big industry is meeting today. And their plan is for real large scale industrial solar in farm, on the field. Yeah, it's good to develop the power. And, but I have a concern that it's again, it's back to the old model. It's big international finance, and the money's there, the finance is already there, big companies are already there. But I prefer to see it develop in a different way. I think we should go first to, to rooftop solar, every house, every factory, and develop that power supply. And, and it's a really sensible power supply, I suppose, because it complements wind. You know, wind comes on a cloudy day, no pressure. You've got the grid connection, you're using it full tilt. When the wind dies, the sun tends to come out. And then you've still got the same grid link, so we can use that power link to balance wind and solar the way that would work for us. But I think it should be, I think it should be every one of us owning it. As well as owning wind. And not just through the board of owners or the creatures of the ESPs. There's a really interesting organization in Belgium I saw last month uh, there where local people in a renewable energy cooperative are buying shares in their own power supply. They're using it to build big wind projects because wind, unfortunately, the economics of wind is that scale does matter. It's very hard to get a 20 meter, 20 or 20 foot, whatever turbine to really make sense, even in very windy Ireland. That's why they're getting slightly bigger. But I think even if they get bigger, that, that, that Belgian ownership model, you can start with a share as low as 250 euros, and it's working for them. It's a model I think we could adopt here. It gives you a share even in a, in a bigger wind farm. That's what it is truly, truly community owned. And we can structure that in ways so that those living nearest maybe get preferable terms and preferable arrangements. That's what we need to do. In solar, it's even easier because it does come. You can put it on your roof. But we don't have the mechanisms to sell it. We don't have, if you look at what the German government is doing now, the German government is changing their entire market system. They have a green paper out in, in March, written in English. Um, and what they're doing is they're creating this completely different market structure where there's a dance between demand flexibility, where you could be clever in terms of how you use electricity, and you take price signals to, to uh, adapt your use, but also with variable power supply at the center. And that's the center of the market arrangement. Rather than big stations, the price is set and the market is designed to suit those small providers. That's what we need to do, change our entire system to support local people selling their own power. And the system at present precludes it, stops you doing it. We need to change that. It will help in the use of biomass. I, I personally, there are a lot of people saying, people who, I, I, Respect people coming back saying, don't do wind, they're saying we should convert money to to biogas, we should convert the peat fire power plants to biogas, we should do more of what they've just done up in North Mayo, this new Kalala plant that they're thinking of building. I'm very deeply skeptical. I'm skeptical, always follow the money and look at the price. How much is it costing to build that Kalala plant? About four million megawatts? Three or four times the price of the renewable alternative. And there's real sustainability issues in us shipping, which they will have to do, or which we're already doing in Eden Dairy, um, palm kernels from Indonesia to Ireland to burn. There are their environmental issues, land use issues around that globally. Which think globally, there are big land use issues around that. And if we, I think there is opportunity for us to develop biomass solutions. And for the Irish farmers, it's a real opportunity. It's a willow, it's, it's very similar to crude taking in silage, same equipment. So it does make sense for us to develop biomass. But I think it will be used in local food factories and other factories. Because the real benefit of using it that way is that 90, 80-90% of the energy is used to in heating in the industrial process and it's creating jobs in food industries at a local level. 
Whereas in a power plant, two thirds of the energy is lost as waste heat that goes up a chimney. We just don't have enough wood. We're talking about hundreds and half millions and millions of tons of wood material if we're to convert Money Point and our peat fire power stations, I'll finish in a minute, uh, to biomass. And we don't have the wood. I know I went looking first. There was a factory came to me and my time as mayor said, I need 100,000 tons of wood. I said, fine, we tried to, we talked to Kiel to talk to your people. This will be an economic opportunity here. The factory's going to apply a couple hundred people. Can you give us 100,000 tons of wood? No. We're using it in the board factory down the road here. We had to shut the board factory in, is it Drum Drummond down the way? Or yeah. Drummond. Yeah. Um, we can't do both. We don't have the wood. And shipping it all in from Texas or from wherever, Indonesia, it's the same. We're not developing our own resources. We are smart here. And use our resources wisely rather than being dependent on a boat coming from Malaysia, which is what that other alternative path would require us to do. And turn a blind eye to what's happening in Malaysia in terms of where that wood comes from. There's other opportunities. They're bigger, long term. Hydro is limited. But there is a small micro hydro we could develop. The big opportunity marine is an opportunity, but I'll be honest, it's not certain yet. It's still a 20 to 30 year bet in terms of real scale. <coughs> Offshore wind does work, and we can look at that, and it's getting more and more competitive. Offshore hydro at our side, tidal and, and wave is the real potential. If we crack it, we have a bounty that makes us unlimited in our opportunity in the sense. But we're not certain about it. We need to develop what we know is certain. I'll finish with a slightly political point that there's no political support for this switch at the present time. Our political system is very sensitive to opposition, to wind, to grid, and we react to that by scaling right back and actually holding back on investment, holding back on sense of direction. And I just don't think that's the right response. We do not have time. The planet is burning. Those who follow late will get least advantage from the transition to this better economy. We will end up buying technology from other countries rather than developing it ourselves. We have every opportunity to develop that technology ourselves and to use the power to power an economy that particularly helps rural Ireland. And that's where we need to go, a prosperous community, own their own energy, using it to create other economic opportunities. That's the prize that we have. We need to listen, talk to each other, have these sort of events to make sure it happens in a really collective, collaborative way. Thank you.